Hi everybody, I'm Tom Snyder and welcome to part two of Lionel Electric Trains, the first 100 years. If you recall part one, we saw the development of Lionel trains back at the turn of the century, the introduction of Lionel's standard gauge, then the development of old gauge and the, uh, the depression years. In part two, the glory years of Lionel trains and all the wonderful equipment they produced during those glory years. We should mention that during this time, Lionel was not the only manufacturer of toy trains in the United States. There were other manufacturers, notably uh, American Flyer, especially in the post-war years. And there was intense competition between American Flyer and Lionel and between the fans of both brands. I, I, I had a friend in, uh, in the late grades in high school, Bob, who uh, had American Flyer trains. And he would always tease me about that dinky third rail that Lionel trains used, saying that, you know, the trains are realistic, but the, but the track looks terrible. And I would say, yeah, the track may look good, but look at your link couplers on the American Flyer trains, and then look at the automatic remote control knuckle couplers on the Lionel trains. And that would end the, uh, the conversation and the competition. Anyway, here's part two of Lionel trains, the first 100 years. Yes, the United States has gone wild with peace. The post-war world that everyone dreamed about is really here, and the American people are making up for lost time. If the 1946 Lionel Line, introduced at the Toy Fair in New York, were a Broadway play, it would have been a smash hit. The new Pensy Turbine topped the list, followed by new scale detail freight cars, the 726 with Irvington cars, accessories, tracks, switches. But smoke, the biggest toy train innovation ever, was the big news. What do I remember? I remember the smoke. The pellets came in a little glass bottle with a black cap and a blue and orange label. You put the pellets into the smokestack and puff, like magic, smoke would come out. We used to lie on the floor and just watch the steam engine go round and round, puffing smoke with the lights of the Christmas tree in the background. Those times were irresistible and unforgettable. Also new was the amazing 38 water tower, which seemed to pump real water. This was the brainchild of Josh Cowan himself, and sales topped the $10 million mark for the first time. American Flyer introduced a fine line of smaller S-gauge trains featuring two rail tracks and steam engines with smoke and choo-choo. Many felt the American Flyer trains with their two rail track and a more realistic appearance were superior to Lionel's. It was a hot debate and it raged in neighborhoods across America. Lionel with superior marketing won the sales race, outselling American Flyer about three to one. However, these fierce loyalties were permanently forged and even today, 50 years later, American Flyer enthusiasts still insist they had the best train. They were oddballs. I, it, it, they were sort of like considered a little artistic, a little creative, but maybe a little subversive. Remember, this is also the McCarthy era, so you were kind of wary of things like that. And that whole idea of scale was a problem for us. Because the nice thing about the Lionel train is the scale was in your mind. You know the, the, the Hell's Gate Bridge or whatever it is? That worked on standard gauge and O gauge. I mean, the same bridge, and the scales are different, and yet you could use it with both sets of trains and not feel that there was anything wrong with that. The three rails were somehow, in our minds, more real than the two rail. There was more opportunity with Lionel, and I liked the looks of Lionel better. I mean, it, it looked a little more real, a little more substantial. Uh, I know I'm gonna offend a lot of uh, collectors of American Flyer, and I got a huge collection <laughs> of AC Gilbert American Flyer. It was a war between the two, but I think Lionel prevailed uh, in a stronger way with their marketing and their product line. The automatic milk car was new, and it would become the most popular operating car ever. Lionel also brought out a model of the Raymond Lowy-designed GG1 and a new line of low-price sets called Scout, 
but perhaps after Tonto's horse. Nineteen forty eight was a very good year for both Lionel and America. The railroad shifted to diesel power, and the most popular new diesel was the Electromotive Division's F3. Lionel introduced the F3 in two road names, a striking red and silver Santa Fe, and a handsome two-tone gray New York Central. The Santa Fe would run for 18 years and become the best-selling engine that Lionel ever produced. In fact, it's the engine most people think of when you mention Lionel. Other important new items included the diesel coal loader, the conveyor lumber loader, and the Lionel Electronic Control Railroad. Priced at $200, this set was strictly for rich kids. Lionel has always been innovative. An example was the electronic set. The big deal about the electronic set was that you could uncouple cars or activate operating cars anywhere on the layout without the use of a remote control section of track. The set came with a new electronic control unit that was used to power the cars. The cattle car was also new. It became, after the milk car, Lionel's best-selling operating car. And the transformer of everyone's dreams was unveiled, the ZW. It was big, it was heavy, it had two handles, just like controlling real trains. Uh, you could run U.S. Steel Gary Works with those things. Uh, mm, mm. Face it, in the years from then to now, the world, and especially the world we happen to, the corner of the world we happen to inhabit, has not gotten better. That's a golden age by comparison. I mean, there wasn't movie violence. There wasn't violence in the street. Family life was still intact. America knew she was number one. You hear that train coming down the tracks, that woo, 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 and you're back to that better period of time. There's no doubt about that. When I was a kid, I had a lot of problems, but my mother died when I was nine, and uh, my father was kind of a, he wasn't around a lot. and. Uh, I spent a lot of my time tied to the, the Lionel gave me a sense of, uh, of security, you know, uh, of, uh, of knowing I could count on the trains. Uh, even when nobody was home, I could come home from school, nobody would be there, but the trains were there. They were like, sort of like mom, you know. <laughs> so that for me was, uh, was a, a, a real strong influence. And because of the quality and because of the reliability, that's I have a I have a, almost a, a a parental tie to it. For the first time, Lionel recognized the existence of women. Mom and Sis made the cover of the 1949 catalog. There was a new model of the General Motors MW2 switcher with a mechanical ringing bell, and a new rail gripping invention called Magnatraction. Sales reached 15 and a half million dollars. Now, to show off all these new products, Lionel designed a new layout for their showroom at 15 East 26th Street in Manhattan. The layout measured 16 by 32 feet and was treated by Lionel buffs everywhere with a reverence usually reserved for a religious shrine. Lionel celebrated its 50th birthday by bringing back the Hudson. Oh, not the pre-war scale masterpiece, but a good model nonetheless.
a new 027 Union Pacific Alco headed three yellow streamlined passenger cars in a set that would eventually be called the anniversary set by collectors. and magnet traction promised more speed, more pull, more climb, more control. The 456 operating coal ramp was new, along with the oil dairy, and a lift bridge that was pictured in the catalog, but never made. Lionel sales reached 21.5 million, and a survey showed the Lionel name ranked right behind Cadillac and Sears in terms of acceptance and perception of quality. And it was really not playing trains. It was playing like that whole world of a village here and a city there and tracks in between and people coming out there and going to work and shipping things and taking trips and all that. And we would call out to each other, the, you know, I'm coming in here now, she's coming down to the station, we're going to go to the city. There was, it was like a little play that took place in our minds and that was the playing field for it. The happy family of 1949 returned, but the Korean War put a damper on further expansion. No new products were introduced, but sales did increase to $19 million anyway. Throughout their history, Lionel has always looked for a non-train item they could sell during the off-season. In 1912, they came up with the first slot cars. An operating electric range for girls was introduced in 1930, motorboats in the mid-30s, and an airplane in 1936. Lionel introduced the Line X 3D camera in 53, and in 1954, the Air X line of fishing gear. And in 1989, Lionel came out with small toy cars called revolvers. The 1952 catalog cover was one of the best ever. What kid would not be smiling, looking at that six-track mainline with all those headlights blazing? New diesels, including a Western Pacific F3, a blue and yellow C&O switcher, and a Rock Island Elko. And the top set, the Lionel Super Speedliner, a double-A Santa Fe F3, and four new aluminum streamlined cars. A hundred and eighty thousand milk cars were sold, and the barrel loader and operating switch power were new accessories, and sales were up to over twenty-eight million dollars. And then 1953, Lionel's biggest year ever, sales peaking at $32.9 million. The 497 Coaling Station and the 6464 Series Boxcars, which would become hot collector's items, were introduced. Everything sold, and Lionel became the biggest toy company in the world. American Flyer also had its best year with sales of $16 million. Despite the banner year, though, there were ominous signs. Rail travel continued declining as more and more people chose to travel on the new airplanes rather than on the old trains. The Lionel catalog became a major event in a boy's life. Every page was scrutinized and looked at over and over. The images stored safely away, ready for immediate recall when time permitted, a little dreaming and wishing. One of the best illustrations ever to appear in a Lionel catalog is this two-page spread from the 1948 edition. The angle of sight is low, and the GG1 appears massive, shiny, and irresistible. The Lionel catalog was as important to Lionel's success as their trains.
the uh, the artwork in the catalog is just unbelievable. It just it took you to another place. I think played the major part in, in a lot of the post-war interest. And one of the parts in the catalog in '52 was the accessory page where they put where they brought the switch tower out, and they had that, and they had the animated uh, freight station, and they had the signal bridge. All of that stuff in that catalog, that page is just fabulous. I mean, I wish I could recreate that on the layout, just in one little spot, just because that's the best. <laughs> the catalogs were, were just fantastic. Uh, it was the relationship of father and son. The things that really pop out at me are the product line, the illustrations, the way they presented things in the catalog showing, you know, kind of a, oblique shots of, of, of them and stacking them up side by side. And uh, the reality was very equal to the fantasy. In fact, it was probably much better than the fantasy. They did a great job with their illustrations in the catalog of whetting the appetite. A seaboard was added to the NW2 switcher lineup and a gorgeous red and white Texas Special, along with a white and green Southern, were added to the F3s. A new diesel, the Lackawanna FM Trainmaster with two motors, was the largest single unit ever built by post-war Lionel. The 50 gang car, the first of many popular motorized units, was new, and more 64-64 boxcars were offered. Displays always played a big part in Lionel's marketing plans and they designed many different types. The most intriguing was this display called the Lionel Illusion. It came with two 2035 Locos, a tender, and 13 gondolas. The Illusion had to do with the tunnel. The train would enter at one end and seem to disappear. One of these displays sold at auction recently for $25,000. It cost $80 back in the 50s. The Wabash and Illinois Central were new F3s. and a Virginia FM was added, along with a red and yellow reversible trolley, and a U.S. Army switcher. New accessories included the diesel fueling station, the ice depot, and the piggyback transportation set. The handsome congressional set, headed by a Tuscan GG1, pulled four aluminum streamlined passenger cars. But sales fell 38% from the 1953 peak as the number of 8 to 10 year old boys, Lionel's core market, began to level off. The country was booming, but Lionel was selling trains to a market that was growing smaller, not bigger. And this did not bode well. We can do for ourselves as adults what the parents couldn't do for us coming out of the Depression and World War II. We can fill in those gaps in our childhood. There's no doubt about that. And we can recover the past, you know. Uh, and the nice thing about them is that they're slightly rusted now. They're no longer right off the shelf. They show how many years between there and now. A lot of guys buy erector sets and they chrome plate all the girders again. I don't want to touch them. I don't want to take that patina of history off the thing. I want to know what happened to me in all those years and measure them out from all these toys. In 1956, Lionel attempted to rebound with an impressive lineup of new trains and accessories and the new mascot, the Lionel Lion. A Jersey Central FM, the Bud Rail Diesel Car, and New Haven EP5 Electrics were new.
along with the Milwaukee Road and Baltimore and Ohio F3s. New operating cars included the Searchlight Extension car, the GM Generator car, the Brakeman car, and the Burrow Crane. The Sound Dispatching Station and a Lumber Mill were new accessories, and despite all this, sales continued to fall. America's fascination had turned skyward. Sputnik was launched, and for the first time, airliners carried more passengers than trains. Lionel tried to keep pace by introducing a line of space and military toys and a more realistic track, Super O. But nothing helped. Kids were playing with slot cars, space toys, robots. And those people who were buying trains were buying smaller trains, especially H.O. Gage. Much of this change had to do with space. More people were living in homes and apartments that had smaller rooms, and HO became the most popular gauge. And more and more manufacturers jumped in to get a piece of this fast-growing market. Now, Lionel at first did not notice the inroads that HO was making, because in those post-war boom years, there seemed to be enough business for everybody. But by the mid-1950s, the sales of HO trains exceeded sales of Lionel's O gauge, and HO sales were on the rise, while Lionel sales were headed inexorably down. Lionel made a deal with River Rossi, an Italian manufacturer known for making quality HO trains. Lionel introduced their first line of HO gauge trains in 1957, and it was a good one. In 1958, Lionel turned to Athern, and in 1959, purchased tooling from Hobby Line and started to manufacture their own HO trains. Lionel introduced HO versions of their O-gauge operating cars and accessories. The operating gateman, banjo signal, rotary beacon, the milkman, military and space cars, and other operating cars. A misguided marketing decision led to a girl's train. It featured a pink engine and freight cars in pastel colors, a giant flop at the time, the girls' train eventually became a valuable collector's item. I never knew a girl to touch an electric train in those days. The toys were very gender-linked in those days. Girls had the little stoves and uh, the doll buggies and all that, and we had the industry thing, housemaker, captain of industry kind of thing. New engines included a Canadian Pacific F3 heading four aluminum streamlined passenger cars. A Milwaukee Road EP5 electric. And a Norfolk and Western J. It was another big year for accessories. New were the culvert loader and unloader. The operating forklift platform. The dispatching board. The animated newsstand, and transfer table. Mm -hmm. 
Sales fell to under $19 million, but Lionel managed to make a profit, the last of the post-war era. In an attempt to reverse the downward trend, Lionel introduced more space-age and military toys, including rocket launchers, rocket-carrying flat cars, trains with military loads, including anti-aircraft guns, an amphibious duck, and radar units. The 68 executive inspection car and number 54 ballast tamper were new motorized units and the Pennsylvania and Virginia were new electrics. But sales fell to 14.4 million and the company showed a loss of $469,000, the first since the depression. Joshua Lionel Cowan retired. He had seen enough. In 1959, Lionel introduced more military trains with more play value a U.S. Army rocket launcher, Atomic Energy Commission switcher, helicopter launching car, a radar car, an IRBM launcher, and a flat car with missiles. Well, I grew up in what would be considered the space era. I mean, Lionel was getting into producing flat cars with submarines, rockets, uh, things that shot things, shot target balloons out of the air. Um, but once again, it was a very strong market. There was, you know, probably 40, 50 percent of my friends all had Lionel trains. I talk to my children today, uh, maybe none of their friends have trains. Maybe their father has trains. They talk about it in that level. And I think Lionel's market today is not aimed and geared toward a young train operator as much as we're dealing with a collector's market, an older market, where they know there's money to be spent on it. The General, a fine model of the 440 American type steam locomotive from the Civil War period, was also new. The years from 1955 to 1959 were particularly outstanding, especially from the point of view of the collector. Those years saw the rarest of the F3s, including the Canadian Pacific, the Baltimore and Ohio, the Milwaukee Road, the Rio Grande, the New Haven, and the Bud Cars, Norfolk and Western Jays, the Northern Pacific and Minneapolis St. Louis Jeeps, the Great Northern and Virginian Electrics, the General, the Congressional Set, and the Jersey Central Fairbanks Morse. The next 10 years would prove to be the most challenging in Lionel's history. The country's interest in toy trains declined every year, along with Lionel's sales. The company changed hands often and went through a series of weak, disinterested management teams. What little effort that was expended was directed at developing non-train items, items such as chemistry sets, slot car racing sets, weather stations, plastic engineering kits, and other items that had no connection with Lionel's core product. By the end of the 1960s, Lionel was in bad shape. The interest in toy trains was almost non-existent. Even though interest in toy trains was sagging, some highly collectible items were produced. Included were another version of the 773 Hudson, some interesting passenger sets headed by Alcos,
in a highly prized freight set headed by a solid stripe GG1. September 8th, Joshua Lionel Cowan, at the age of 85, died. I think Joshua Lionel Cowan is, is an idol to all of us. Cowan's genius was looking forward as to what they should do with the company, uh, the business management end of it. Uh, he knew how to pull people together as a team and make it work and uh, bring all the various disciplines uh, into a very disciplined manner to turn out a very good product. By the late 60s, the Lionel Corporation had pretty much given up on toy trains and was diversifying into electronics and other areas. Enter General Mills, looking to expand their toy line. They saw equity in the Lionel name, a built-in customer base, and a vision of steady sales increases as the baby boomers who made Lionel the biggest toy company in the world in the early 50s, reached their peak earning years. So the deal was done. Lionel leased their name and rights to manufacture train products to General Mills, and Lionel trains were once again in capable hands as the last quarter of the 20th century drew near. A new era, called the modern era, began. The first consumer catalog by the new Lionel unfolded into a large poster depicting the history of trains in America. Rolling stock came with fast angle wheels with needlepoint bearings. The new wheel design was a big lift with operators because it reduced friction, allowing for much longer trains. But the big news was the mighty sound of steam. The famous name boxcar series featured colorful models of boxcars similar to the 6464 type cars. In the early 70s, Lionel produced new diesel locomotives such as the GP20 and the U36B. The baby Madison cars were a new passenger car design and the classic post-war F3 was reissued and met with mixed reviews. These trains were decorated using modern techniques, but they lacked some of the details of the originals. Since the mid-1950s, HO gauge has been the most popular model railroad gauge in America, and Lionel tried to again enter this market in 1974. In 1974 and 1975, the trains were produced by Rocco of Austria. By 1976, most production was moved to the Far East. Some interesting sets included a scale, highly detailed model of the Freedom Train headed by a GS4. The uncatalogued American Flyer set made for Sears and the always spectacular Southern Pacific Daylight. Also offered were building kits, which included an ornate passenger station made by Pola.
1975, Lionel celebrated its 75th anniversary with a special train set. It featured logos and highlights from Lionel's past. A new drawbridge operated a lot like the classic bascule bridge from the old Lionel. Lionel created the Railroaders Club in 1976, and singer Johnny Cash, a huge Lionel fan and spokesman, was the first to join. Lionel produced a special bicentennial commemorative train for the Train Collectors Association. The winning combination of Mickey Mouse and Lionel were reunited with a special freight set. passenger set was assigned the name of a pre-war icon. It was called the Blue Comet. The twin-motored Fairbanks Morse train master, one of Lionel's best post-war diesels, returned in 1979, and both collectors and operators were thrilled. In 1980, Lionel split their catalog into two categories, traditional, featuring starter sets, and collector, featuring high-end products. Some were packaged in retro orange and blue boxes, which evoked memories of post-war Lionel packaging. Lionel expanded its reissues of post-war items to include big steamers, motorized units, animated rolling stock, and accessories. Though almost identical in design, the graphics were different. New items were developed as well. A massive SD40 diesel introduced in 1982. And a colorful Southern Pacific Daylight GS4. When General Mills took over train production of Lionel, they also acquired the rights to produce American Flyer. And Lionel produced two handsome Flyer sets in 1981. In a misguided effort to cut labor costs, Lionel moved most of its production to Tijuana, Mexico. It was a disaster from start to finish. There were language problems, production delays, poor quality, bad management. Finally, Lionel returned to Michigan. In 1985, Richard P. Kuhn, a Detroit businessman and enthusiastic Lionel collector, opened negotiations to buy Lionel. On April 26, 1986, the deal was completed, and Richard Kuhn became the sole owner of Lionel Trains, Inc. A new chapter in Lionel's history began. My business advisors, my accountants, uh, who told me that I really shouldn't do this, it was too much of a risk. At that point, if I did not have the emotional side and the love of Lionel the way I did, I never would have bought the company. So it was a blend. I, I said to myself, I think I can take the emotion and make that a part of the business plan of moving it forward and between the two maybe do something with a company and put the stuff back in the market. Richard Kuhn's vision was to expand the high-end collector line. I knew that we were not doing the product line that the consumer wanted. So we went through quite a study looking at the possibility of remote control and improving sound systems. We have to look at all of our options and, and come up to speed when it comes to electronics. In 1988, Lionel produced RailScope. It was a small video camera 
placed inside the engine that transmitted a black and white engineer's eye view picture as it traveled down the track. Lionel began to reissue pre-war tin plate trains in both standard and O gauges. Call Lionel Classics, the gorgeous Hiawatha passenger set from 1935, was the first. I thought the Classics line was a great idea, especially if you had a layout. Being able to operate all those great trains from the past was a big thrill. You could keep the original on the shelf and operate the reissue. Lionel also entered the rapidly expanding G-scale market. These trains were big and whimsical and presented Lionel the opportunity to expand sales in a new market. Electronic sounds have been an important part of modern era Lionel ever since the mighty sound of steam in 1970. And in 1989, rail sounds, a major development in model railroading, was introduced. Neil Young and I tied together, and uh, he, Neil, is a great, great guy uh, when it comes to electronics. On top of being a great musician and a great composer, he was a natural to team up with, and so we formed Lion Tech. It's in his heart, it's under his skin, it's in his head. He's got the same incurable disease. <laughs> Lionel celebrated its 90th anniversary in grand style by reissuing the standard gauge Blue Comet set and the 700E scale Hudson. To meet the growing demand for scale trains, Lionel introduced the T1 it would turn out to be a breakthrough locomotive. The T1 was a landmark locomotive because it told the Lionel customer it was okay to buy scale. It also started a new wave in layout building. The toy train layout was out and a new type of layout called high rail was in. The high railer wanted the scale look with the dependability of three rail operation. This opened the door for Lionel and their competitors to a new scale market, which has dramatically changed the landscape of the toy train hobby. Lionel reissued the Santa Fe F3, the most popular toy train ever. and the Irvington cars. Now with a Sager Place observation car. New items include multiple unit commuter cars. A lift bridge. and the steam, clean, and wheel grind shop. In keeping with its tradition of showroom layouts, Lionel opened the visitor center in their headquarters building in Michigan. It featured a 16 by 45 foot layout and a wall depicting the company's history. Lionel, always the innovator, broke new ground once again with the introduction of Trainmaster Command Control. Developed by Lion Tech, a joint venture between Neil Young and Richard Kuhn, it allowed the operator to control his layout from anywhere in the room. Trainmaster Command Control also opened many new control options.
Train Master Command Control revolutionized the operation of toy trains. It allowed the operator to control the trains while walking around the room. It opened a new world of possibilities. For example, locomotives now came with the authentic sounds of their prototypes, including the bell effects, whistles, brake squealing, diesel roar, and steam chuffing. While I understand the uh, attraction of command control and uh, rail sounds and all the other technology that Lionel and other manufacturers have in introduced, I like the buzz of the old three position E unit. I like the fact that all I have to do is uh, worry about making the train go backward and forward and having the whistle blow. And I don't have to worry about maintaining all that other stuff that you people have to fix every time it goes wrong. In 1995, Lionel braced for yet another major change. Richard Kuhn, wanting to cut back his workload, sold the majority interest of Lionel to an investment group headed by Martin Davis, a well-known player in the high-stakes mergers and acquisitions game. Under Kuhn, Lionel had prospered, and some great trains were produced. And so on September the 29th, 1995, Lionel Trains, Inc. became Lionel LLC. The new Lionel hit the ground running. The new regime was eager to impress and came out with several new upscale items, including the Commodore Vanderbilt with scale heavyweight Pullmans. a weathered Norfolk and Western freight set, the Lionel Steel service station special set, and a handsome, attractively priced New York Central GP9. Listen to its horn. I think it's the best diesel horn ever produced. There comes a time when you pass the baton on to younger people. That is the reality I came to. I talked to Neil Young and uh, told Neil, who was my partner in Lion Tech, that I was thinking of doing this, and I, he said, oh my goodness, uh, maybe I should get in the act on this thing. And that's when he brought in uh, Martin Davis of Wellsprings, and that seemed like a pretty good fit. So I was comfortable with selling the company. I would hope that people would say that uh, I was good for the company, that we were innovative, we brought new things into the marketplace. I would hope that uh, they will re remember what we did when I owned the company for carrying on the, the real tradition of Lionel Trains, which was the dreams of Joshua Lionel Cowan, that, that we did a good job. <laughs> well, Dick Coon was fun to watch because he had great enthusiasms and he loved Lionel. 
He was like a kid in a candy store, or I guess I should say a kid in a hobby shop. Dick brought quality back to Lionel, and he introduced new and exciting trains. He lowered the prices on starter sets so Lionel trains were available to a broader market. And like Joshua Lionel Cowan, Dick was innovative. He worked with Neil Young to bring out the new sound and control systems. But the main thing Dick accomplished was to keep Lionel profitable so when it came time to sell, Lionel would be attractive to a new buyer. Dick picked up the torch when nobody wanted it and made the fire burn bright so it could be passed down. Dick Kuhn was totally immersed in every aspect of Lionel and loved every minute of it. Even today, I love Lionel products. I have them all. <laughs> Lionel announced the Century Club, a celebration of Lionel tradition and the upcoming centennial. Members were offered five classics, the 726 Berkshire, the 671 Turbine, the 2332 Pennsylvania GG1, the 2333 New York Central F3s, and the 773 Hudson. Each featured the latest in electronics while retaining their post-war look. The success of the Century Club led to the post-war celebration series and more reissues of classic post-war items, this time designed to look exactly like the originals, but like the Century Club items, they came with the latest high-tech features. In 1999, the Hellgate Bridge and the 97 coal elevators, both an improvement over the originals, were home runs. Lionel also served notice it would be a player in the fast-growing high-end scale market by offering two scale articulated engines, the Allegheny and Big Boy. Richard Maddox, formerly head of sales and marketing at Bachman, was appointed Lionel's new president. Richard welcomes the challenge of leading Lionel into the next century. It's the heritage, uh, it's a hundred year company. Uh, everyone loves being part of that. Everyone loves being part of, of uh, supporting this, this incredible American icon. And the other side of it is that I think our people recognize uh, the, the passion and the excitement there is about this product in the marketplace and and uh, how dedicated um, the collectors and the operators of Lionel product are uh, to this company and you can't get help but, but get caught up in that enthusiasm.
Lionel trains enter our consciousness when we are very young and never really leave. Oh, they're put on the back shelf for a while, but all it takes is a chance meeting, a serendipitous glance in a hobby store window, and all those memories come flooding back. Few products inspire such loyalty, passion, and zeal. Thousands attend weekend train shows in cities all across the country. Some are operators, some collectors, some are rich, some poor, but all connected by a mutual fascination with a toy. Things change, but the basic appeal of the toy train chugging down the track never changes. It is as irresistible now in 2000 as it was in 1900. Lionel, it would seem, is forever. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the trip. Stop.